Good morning. Are we on? Great. Well, great to be here with you. Thank you, Pastor Lawrence, and uh, to Pastor Daniel as well for the invitation and the opportunity to come here. Um, it's great to be with you. You call your youth children's amplifier. Yeah. Wow. What a great name for a bunch of kids. Because <laughs> amplify means to make loud. <laughs> to expand and to make loud. And isn't that what kids are meant to be? Loud. And we want to expand their horizons. You can make a little bit more noise than that. Okay. This is not a conservative church, is it? No. Okay. So you can make as much noise as you want. I'm not afraid of noise. Okay. But thank you for the opportunity to come. It's really great to be here with you. I mean, Christmas upon us already. It's crazy, hey? I mean, I don't know about you, but it seems like the older I get, the quicker the year goes. It just runs by, just speeds by. And uh, you go to the shopping centres at the moment, it's just chaos. It's chaotic. People rushing here and there, trying to, trying to find gifts and um, prepare holidays and Christmas meals and put up trees and lights and everything else. It's just that frantic, busy time of year. Um, who's ever had a problem trying to find a gift? <laughs> One or two people. I always have a problem trying to find the right gift. Reminds me of a story I heard about these three brothers and they, um, they'd all left home, they'd gone to different parts of the country and uh, they'd done very, very well for themselves. In actual fact, all of them had their own businesses and they'd become millionaires. And so they decided this particular Christmas, um, their father had passed away, their mother was getting elderly, and they wanted to do something really special for her. So um, they got together and discussed it, and the, and the eldest brother said, you know, I've, I'm building my mother, I'm building our mother a brand new house. The second son says, I'm going to buy mum a brand new Mercedes limousine so she can drive around in. That's a pretty good Christmas present. And then the youngest son says this. He says, I've got you all beat. Because you know how much mum likes to read the Bible. But her eyesight is failing. So I hunted everywhere and I found a special talking parrot that can actually recite the whole Bible. This church's elders took 12 years to train that parrot. And all you have to do is tell them the book, the chapter, and the verse that you want to hear, and the parrot will recite that verse by heart. And so they have Christmas, and the gifts are given out, and a couple of months later, the mother realises, oh, I better, I better write a thank you card to my sons. So she writes to the first son and says, look, thank you for the house, but, you know, the reality is I only live in one room, and it's such a big house, and it takes me all my time to try and clean it. She writes to the second son and says, look, thank you for the beautiful Mercedes-Benz, but, you know, I'm so old now, I just don't drive. I just don't use it anymore. And she writes to the third son and says, dear Gordon, thank you so much for your present. You know, you always know exactly what to give your mother. The chicken was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I had a giggle when I saw that as well. With all the busyness of Christmas, it's not about the tree, it's not about the lights, it's not about the gifts, it's not about the family reunions and dinners, as, as wonderful as those things are. But Christmas is about the birth of a child. Not just any birth, but a supernatural miracle birth. And we read about it in the Gospels. Um, if these slides work, is this going to work? No. Yes, there we go. We've all seen that kind of photo. We know that story where there's this group of shepherds. They're out in the field and uh, they're just minding their own business, looking after the sheep. And then all of a sudden the skies just open and an angel appears to them. 
It says, don't be afraid. It's the glory of God just comes and surrounds him with this brilliant light. He says, don't be afraid, for I bring you good news. Today a saviour is born in the town of David. And so they're, they're amazed. I mean, that is an incredible experience. But then the skies part even further, and then thousands of angels appear. And they say, we bring you good news of great joy. Peace to all men. Can you imagine what that would be like to have that kind of experience? This wasn't a UFO suddenly appearing. This was an AFO. These were angelic flying objects. And all of a sudden they're confronted with this. And they say, well, man, we've, we've got to go and find, if, find out if this is true. So they rush off and they, they go to Bethlehem because they know that that is the town of David. And they go there and they actually follow the angel's instructions and they find this little baby laying in a manger exactly as, as the angels had said. And so the Bible records that they went off and they told everyone about it. But you see, that was a bit of a problem for shepherds because in the social standing of Jewish culture, shepherds were right near the bottom. In fact, there was only one class of people who were lower than shepherds, and they were lepers. If you were a shepherd, you couldn't give testimony in a court of law. You couldn't stand as a witness. Why was that? Because shepherds were regarded as bandits and thieves. They weren't very high on the social scale. And the reason for that is because for most of the year, they, were, you know, they didn't have farms like we have with fences. They just roamed the countryside to find fresh feed for their sheep. And very often, they could only make money at, a cer at certain times of the year when they could sell their sheep. And so often, they would have to scrounge and try and find food for themselves, whatever they needed. And many of them turned to being thieves, and they would rob people. And so they weren't, a very, um, they weren't very highly regarded in the community. And yet here they are, they've had this incredible experience, this angelic visitation, and they want to tell people. Isn't that amazing that God would pick lowly shepherds to announce one of the greatest stories in world history? Why? Why would God choose shepherds? You see, God is not a respecter of persons. He treats everyone equally. And it doesn't matter your race, it doesn't matter your gender, it doesn't matter your social standing, it doesn't matter your level of education or how holy or religious you think you are. God loves everyone. And he treats everyone the same. A supernatural birth that took place. And we read about it in the Gospels. In particular, this story with the, with the angels visiting is, is recorded in the Gospel of Luke. And Luke writes in his opening verse, he says, I've gone out and I've been meticulous in checking out all the eyewitness accounts about Jesus so that what I'm writing to you is actually is factually true. You can have no doubt that this story is true. A miracle birth. It's my wife sitting here in the front. Why don't you stand up, Robin? This is Robin. And uh, so we've been married for um, 44 years, 45 years next March. But not long after we were married, about a, about a year and a half after we were married, Robin uh, had a really bad case of appendicitis. And uh, in fact, we had to rush her down to the hospital. And while she was waiting uh, in the waiting room, her appendix burst. And uh, it was a very serious situation. They had to rush her into hospital and do, you know, into surgery, do emergency surgery. Um, tried to clean up the all that poison that just goes everywhere in your body, um, and then gave us some antibiotics, stitched her up, 
stayed there for a couple of days and sent her home. But she had ongoing abdominal pain for months and months after and the doctors couldn't figure out why. They did a few tests, just didn't know what was going on. And a couple of years after that, when we were trying to have children, we discovered that that infection from that burst appendix had actually completely destroyed her reproductive system. So she had about a half of an ovary left that was functional. She had no fallopian tubes. Her womb had been damaged. And for a couple of years, the doctors did a whole series of operations and treatments and everything to try and rectify the problem. But in the end, they said, look, we're sorry. We're, there's nothing more we can do for you. You will never have children. And uh, so that's quite a devastating thing to happen for a young married couple. And so their advice was to, look, just go home, relax, rest, and then apply for adoption. So we did that. And uh, adoption in, in South Australia at that time was a, about a two-year process to go through with all the interviews and house inspections and all the stuff that goes with it. And so we went through all of that, had the interviews. We were about to have our last interview. This is about probably 14 months into the process. And Robin comes home one day from the doctor and says, you won't believe this, but I'm pregnant. <laughs> now, we'd prayed. We'd, we'd, we'd prayed for a miracle. We'd prayed for God to heal her, and he did just unexpectedly, just out of the blue. And so we called our first son, Luke Samuel. Samuel, a prophet in the Old Testament. Luke, who was a doctor who wrote this gospel. But now we have a son who defied the doctor's prognosis. And so we called him Luke Samuel. <laughs> a prophetic name. Yeah. A prophetic name for his future. You know, we, we here in the West, we don't put a lot of uh, we, don't, we don't put a lot of importance on people's names when we name our kids. And uh, we tend to do... Let me just change this. We tend, to, um, we tend to name our children out of either out of family tradition or more recently, probably in the last 10 to 15 years, we follow trends. Have you noticed that, that names become trendy? You know, and, uh, and especially if you look at some of the Hollywood stars and the way they name their kids. Uh, I don't know if you've ever looked at any of those, but, you know, Sam Worthington, the movie star, um, he, named, he named his son Rocket Zot. <laughs> um, Tia Leone, who's another movie star, she named her son Kid. Can you imagine that? You name your kid, kid. It's like naming your dog, dog. <laughs> Kim Kardashian named her son Northwest. Huh? Beyonce named her daughter Blue Ivy. A guy that I remember because I'm a bit older than many of you, but a musician in the 60s and 70s is Frank Zappa. He named his daughter Moon Unit. Where do they come up with these names? <laughs> who's, who's heard these names? These are three, three girls. Um, Poppy Honey, Daisy Boo, Petal Blossom Rainbow. They're Jamie Oliver's kids. I used to work, I did some work in a recording studio, music studio back in Adelaide, and the guy who ran that, he had four daughters. Summer, Autumn, sunshine, and rainbow. <laughs> I don't think parents think about, what does this mean for those kids when they get older? <laughs> but you see, in Jewish culture, it's not like that. In Jewish culture, names were very important because they meant something. They spoke of the, something of the character and the personality of that child and they spoke of that child's future. For instance, the name Israel means uh, prince of God. The name Micah means he who is like God. And so names in Jewish culture were very, very important. They carried meaning. They carried purpose. They carried destiny. And I want us to read um, just 
some scriptures this morning. It's a bit of a lengthy read, but I want you to notice three names. I want you to have a look at these three names as we read these scriptures. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Three names. Jesus, Christ, and Emmanuel. I was working in a, in a dental laboratory in Adelaide many, many years ago, and a, and a young man came up to me and he, and he said, uh, Tony, you're a religious man. And I said, well, no, I'm not. I'm a Christian. <laughs> but he said, look, can you answer this question for me? I was at my... At my uh, kids' nativity scene play last night, and they kept saying Jesus is Emmanuel, and I couldn't figure it out because I thought his name was Jesus Christ. What's this Emmanuel thing? Is that his middle name? Because that's what he thought. He thought Jesus, first name, Christ, his surname. Oh, Emmanuel must be his middle name. You know, many people think think that way. Many Christians think that way. But no, those three names were names that were descriptive of the same person. Names in Jewish culture mean something very, very important. Those names had to do with the fulfilment of prophecies or foretellings about Jesus. In fact, the place that he was going to be born was prophesied over 700 years before he was born. that he would be born of a, of a virgin prophesied over 700 years before. You know, there's over 66 direct prophecies about the birth, the life, and the death and resurrection of Jesus. Another 270 uh, prophecies about his life. You know, for just one of those prophecies, or actually just the, for eight of those prophecies to be fulfilled, you know, the odds are one in 100 million billion. Think about that. One in 100 million billion. So what do these three names mean? Why are they significant? What's in a name? Jesus, the Saviour. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Do you know that Jesus was a very common name in, in Israel? In, uh, in, the old, it, it, it's, it's, in the Old Testament, it's the name Yeshua or Joshua. It's the same name. And it means saviour. God is our salvation. The one who comes to save us from our sin. But what's sin? What is sin? You know, religious people talk about it all the time. What is sin? Well, sin is any action that is offensive to God. And I guess if we think about our lives, I'm sure all of us, it doesn't matter who we are, we do things from time to time that are, is offensive to God. Mankind was created perfect and without sin. But all that changed when Adam chose to disobey God. Well, rather, he chose to not believe in what God had said. 
He chose his own wisdom over God's. And he believed a lie about God. And he rebelled against God. And he sinned. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. See, we were made to live in the glorious presence of God. But sin changed all of that. You know, that word sin, it's, it's, it actually comes from an old archery term. So when an archer was aiming at a target, if his arrow dropped short and missed that target, that was called a sin because he'd missed the target that he was aiming for. And God has a plan for our life. Sin causes us to miss that plan. But Jesus came to solve that problem. You see, sin isn't simply breaking a law. Sin has a consequence. The Bible tells us that that consequence is death. Adam would die. He was separated from the presence of God. And ever since that time, man has been trying to find his way back to God. He's been trying to find a way to make himself worthy of God's presence again. But he fails every time. You know, religious people love to talk about sin. I don't. You know, they make long lists of sins. They categorise sin. They number sin. They, they accuse other people of being horrible sinners. Um, some even go so far as to say God hates sinners. Well, he doesn't. He loves sinners. He hates sin because it separates us from God, but he loves sinners. In fact, Jesus was accused of being a sinner. Look at this. This is what God says about us. This is how much God loves us. He loved the world. He gave his one and only unique son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in him will never perish but experience everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to judge and condemn the world, but to be its saviour and to rescue it. For when the time was right, the anointed one came and died to demonstrate his love for sinners who were entirely helpless, weak and powerless to save themselves. And so the whole purpose of Jesus coming was to deal with the consequences of sin, to deal with everything that separates us from God. He came as the Saviour. He came so that we could be brought back to God because we are powerless to do that ourselves. But Jesus came to do it for us. The Saviour, the one who saves us from sin, the one who deals with the problem of death that came because of sin. The second name that Jesus was given is the Christ. Jesus Christ. It's not his surname. It's a name that's descriptive of who he is. You know, through the course of Jesus growing up and then beginning to minister, his true personality, his true character and nature was being revealed. And people realised this is no ordinary man. This is a man who is very, very special. In fact, this is the one that we've been looking for for centuries. This is the Messiah that was spoken of in the Old Testament. For those of you who don't know, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, ancient Hebrew. The New Testament is written in Greek. In, in the Old Testament, it's, they refer to this one who is coming as the Messiah. The Messiah means anointed one. And so the name Christ is just the Greek equivalent of Messiah. It's the anointed one. What does it mean to be anointed? Well, it means to be set apart or to be consecrated for a sacred purpose. You know, in, uh, when kings have their coronation and the crown is placed on their head and they take their throne, we saw that earlier this year with the crowning coronation of King Charles. You know, it's a big affair, a lot of pomp and ceremony. Um, But in Jewish culture, it wasn't about the crown. Jewish kings, when they came to their coronation, were anointed with oil. In fact, four and a half litres of oil were poured over their head. 
just saturated their hair, went all over their face, went down over their clothes. I mean, they ended up standing in a pool of oil because they were being set apart for a sacred purpose to lead God's people. So Jesus came not simply as a man. He came as the anointed one. He says in Luke chapter 4, speaking of Isaiah chapter 60, the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to open blind eyes, to set free the captives, to release the oppressed. And Jesus did that when he walked the earth. He opened blind eyes. He gave hope to those who were oppressed. Acts 10.38 says that God anointed Jesus with power and with the Holy Spirit and he went around doing good, healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. That's Jesus. You see, Jesus dying for us as a man wouldn't have actually achieved anything. But Jesus, the man... Dying as the anointed one, that achieved much. And in his death, he dealt with the issue of sin. He dealt with the thing that was separating us from God. He dealt even with the problem of death. You see, and that's what Easter is all about. It's about this death of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus the anointed one who came for you and I out of his love, his deep, deep love for you and I. That's the greatest gift that's ever been given, the gift of Jesus, to deal with our sin. You see, the birth of Jesus would have no eternal consequence if it wasn't for his death and resurrection. He came born as a human being, fully God, fully man, with perfect untainted blood, the perfect sacrifice. I don't know how this works, but somehow God took all of mankind's sin from the beginning of time to the end of time for every single human being, every sin that you would ever commit into the future and every sin you've ever committed in the past, and he placed it all upon Jesus. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus bore our sin and he carried it away. As far as the east is from the west, he has removed our sin from us and he remembers it no more. Folk, that's the good news of the gospel. That's the good news of the gospel. People keep God at at arm's length. They're fearful of God because they think if he gets too close, he's going to find some things out about me and he won't like me. I've got some news for you. He already knows everything about you. You can't hide anything. (laughs) And yet he loves you. He loves you desperately. And he wants you to know him, to know him. The third name that we have, oh, did I miss the scripture? Why don't we read this? Uh, Next one, no, last. Did I go back? If we were still enemies, so if while we were still enemies, God fully reconciled us to himself through the death of his son, then something greater than friendship is ours. Now that we are at peace with God, And because we share in his resurrection life, how much more will we be rescued from sin, from sin's dominion? And even more than that, we overflow with triumphant joy in our new relationship of living in harmony with God, all because of Jesus. Now, most people live with this low-grade sense of guilt, never feeling quite good enough. But, folk, Jesus came to deal with all of that. The third name we have is Emmanuel. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son 
and we'll call him Emmanuel. God is with us. God is with us. And so the living expression of God became a man and lived among us. And we gazed upon the splendor of his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, overflowing with tender mercy and truth. God with us. You and I were created to live with the presence of God, to experience God. See, that's how Adam and Eve were made. They were made perfect. They were made to live with the tangible presence of God. In fact, the Bible tells us that God would come down and he would walk and he would talk with them every day. Can you imagine what that would be like? Can you imagine how different your life would feel if every day you tangibly had Jesus walking alongside you? Wow, that that would be so incredible. But that's the promise that we have. See, it was Adam's rebellion, it was Adam's sin that caused him to, to lose that privileged position and that opportunity to live with God's presence daily. And because of that, God removed him from his presence. He was, he was expelled from the Garden of Eden. And ever since then, mankind has been trying to claw his way back to God, to claw his way back to God's presence. You know, why did they build monasteries on the top of mountains to try and get closer to God? We're trying to climb that mountain again. You know, even building of pyramids, I don't know what your theory is on that, and UFOs and aliens and all the rest of it, but the building of pyramids and the ziggurats and the Tower of Babel, all of that was to try and get to God. Man's futile effort to try and get to God. But in the coming of Jesus, it wasn't man trying to claw his way back to God. It was God coming back down to man. God with us. So that we could experience him. Who's seen the Ten Commandments? The old movie, Charlton Heston, you know? Yeah. One of my favourite movies when I was growing up as a kid. But in that movie, what we see, and in that story, the reality of that story, the movie is a little bit kind of stretching the truth in some areas, but in the reality of the biblical story of, of Moses and the children of Israel, you know, they were captive, in, living in captivity in Egypt, and God raises up a man called Moses and uh, he comes and he becomes a deliverer for, e- for Israel, bringing them out of bondage, out of slavery, into freedom. And that was whole, God's whole intent, to bring them to a place where they would know him. And so they come out, they're in the wilderness, they, they find themselves at a place called Mount Sinai. And God comes to meet with them. And he comes in a, in a, in a pillar of fire and, and, and smoke and this mountain is shaking and uh, it's God saying, hey, I'm here with you. But they get afraid of that. And so they say to Moses, now look, Moses, you be the guy who meets with God because we can't cope with it. We're going to hold God off at arm's length. You be the guy. So Moses gets instructions from God. He builds a tabernacle, a tent that can travel with him as they're journeying him around. And he goes in and he meets with God regularly in that tent. And the sign is that this cloud of glory would come down over that tent and the people would know God is there. Moses would come out of that tent and his face would shine with the residue glory of God. And again, the people were afraid. So they told him, you've got to put a veil over your face because we just can't cope with that. You see, they felt guilty. They didn't feel worthy. They didn't feel we could cope. We're not worthy to cope with the awesomeness of God's presence. But Moses kept doing that. 
Month after month, day after day, he would meet with God. And he would come out and the glory of God would shine upon him. Then Moses dies. And uh, it seems those glory times just diminish. Israel gets settled in their land. And about 400 years later, a king called David and his son Solomon, they build a permanent place for God's presence. They build the temple in Jerusalem. And the same thing happens. God comes in his glory. In fact, it is so thick and rich and tangible that the people couldn't even walk up the steps to get into the temple. That was the thickness and the reality of God's presence. Now, Robert and I have had the privilege, we've, we've known those kinds of moments. We've been in meetings, we've led meetings where, the, where you can actually physically see a cloud begin to drop. And the presence of God becomes so real and so rich, you're scared to even breathe because the awesomeness of God just fills that room. It's in those times of moments that you see spontaneous miracles begin to happen. People are healed of blindness. Deaf ears are open. Cripples begin to walk. We, we've, we've had the privilege of seeing all of those things. It's been amazing. We've travelled to... 28 different countries and just seeing God move all over the place in amazing ways. And so Israel had this privilege. God would come in the temple and they would know the presence of God. But even that began to wane as bad kings took over. And about 400 years after that, in about 600 BC, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar comes to Jerusalem and he completely destroys that temple. Wipes it right out. Destroys the city, takes people captive. About 100 years later, a group of people get released from Babylon. They go back to Israel. They rebuild that temple. But you know, the glory of God never came back. It never came back in the way that they had experienced before. And so instead of seeking God, they turn to religious programs and religious law-keeping. You see, that's what religion is all about. It's about just keeping laws, keeping rules and regulations. You see, sin is not about breaking a moral code. Sin is about being separated from God. And that's why Jesus came. God with us so that we could experience tangible presence again. In fact, Jesus gives us this promise that if you believe in me, I will come and live within you. I will come and not just be with you, not just give you a form of religiosity, but I will come in tangible reality to walk with you every day and to actually live within you so that you can know my glorious presence. Folk, that's what every one of us have been created for. And when we don't have that, you know what happens in church? We get bored. And we end up turning back to religious traditions, the traditions of men, and to rule-keeping, thinking that is going to get us closer to God. You know, we make our, our New Year's resolutions. New Year's just about upon us. And I guarantee Christians in churches all over the place are going to make a promise to God, next year I'm going to be a better Christian. Next year, I'm going to read my Bible more. Next year, I'm going to pray more. Next year, I'm going to give more. Next year, I'm going to witness more. Next year, I'm going to do a whole lot of stuff. People who are not Christians do exactly the same thing. I'm going to be a better person next year. And you know what happens? You get to the end of the year, and you look back, and you think, <clears throat> And you just feel guilty because you didn't make the mark. You didn't hit the target. It fell short. And, and, and you end up living with this kind of low-grade sense of, of 
worthlessness and guilt. And you've got to try, try and keep pumping yourself up and thinking, oh no, oh no, I can do better next year. But if we just live with the promise and the understanding that God has come to deal with the sin problem, to, to come and to be with us. In fact, this is what Paul says in, uh, in Colossians. He says, God's plan is to make himself known, make known his secret to his people. Sorry, I can't quite read it from here. This rich and glorious secret which he has for all people. And the secret is that Christ is in you, which means you will share in his glory. Who really believes that? Okay, maybe a third of people. Because that's Jesus' promise. That if you believe in me, I will come and make myself real to you. Not externally through a whole lot of religious protocols, but internally with the reality of my presence. You know, a lot of Christian stuff is exterior behavior modification, trying to get you to change from the outside. Jesus comes to live within us to transform us from the inside out. Can I have the worship team just come up, please? Jesus living in us. Emmanuel, God with us. That's what sets Christianity apart from every other religion. See, the promise of Jesus is when he comes to live in you because he is the eternal one. You have eternal life. Because he is the one who is perfectly holy and righteous, when he comes to live in you, he releases his gift of righteousness in you so that when you stand before God, you stand as perfectly righteous just as Jesus is. That blows the mind of most Christians. We can't quite fully comprehend that. And yet the writer in Hebrews says that it's by the one sacrifice of Jesus that as we put our faith in him, through that one sacrifice, he has made us perfect forever. Do you feel perfect? In our mind, in our emotions, most of us don't. But you see, in Christ, God looks at us and says, you are perfect. Because Jesus came to take our sin away, to deal with the consequences of sin, and to live within us. Three names. Jesus, the Saviour, who takes away our sin. The Christ, the anointed one. When he comes and lives within you, he sanctifies you, he consecrates you for his purpose. And Emmanuel, God, with us. You know, the greatest need that people have is to belong to feel accepted, to know who they are, why they're here, and where they will go when they die. Because they're all mortal. This body is going to pass away. It's going to die sometime. But the real question in life is, where will I go afterwards? What will happen to me after? Well, Jesus has the answer. Because he is the one who is eternal and who gives eternal life. And when we put our faith in Jesus, we can begin to experience his perfect love and his perfect peace and his perfect joy and confidence in life because we know where we're going. And you might be here this morning and you don't know those things. You don't know what it's like to actually experience the perfect love of God. 
You don't know what it's like to have real, true peace in your life. You don't know what it's like to have that confidence that you know where you will go when you die. You don't know what it's like even to have joy, real joy, deep joy in your life, irrespective of what goes on around you. But you can because of Jesus. The Bible says this. It's such a simple, simple thing. Religion makes this so complicated. Jesus makes it so simple. This is what Paul writes in the book of Romans. He says, If you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from, the, from death, you will be saved. For it is by our faith in Jesus that we are put right with God. It is by our confession that we are saved. If you don't know Jesus, you never really experienced his love, you, never had, you don't have that confidence of your future, then my invitation to you this morning is simply to say yes to Jesus. And if that's you this morning, I want you to just put your hand on your heart and then just to pray a simple prayer with me. Just pray this so that you, your own ears can hear this. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that you came to deal with my sin. I thank you that you came to give me eternal life. I thank you that you came to live with me and within me, to give me a brand new life so that I may know you. I thank you, Jesus. And this morning I confess you as my Lord and my Saviour. Amen. Amen. You know, that's as simple as it is. And if you prayed that prayer this morning, you know, I, I, I'd love to meet you when the meeting closes. If you want to just come and say hi, I'd love to shake your hand. We'd like to give you some information that can help you. In fact, you're not joining a church, you're not joining our religious organisation. You're coming into the family of Jesus to experience his love. Amen? When we close the meeting, Robin and I would love to pray for any couples and you've struggled to have children. We've seen now almost 40 children born to couples who couldn't have kids. Who the doctors said there's no hope for you. We've prayed for people all over the world. And we've seen almost 40 children being born. Some, of, some people with twins. Multiple kids. We know the power of God. And so we don't, we don't want to embarrass you. We're not going to make a public spectacle. At the end of the meeting, if you just want to quietly come and see us, we would love to pray for you. And uh, for those of you who prayed that prayer earlier, we would love to be able to just give you some information. So just come down one side. Maybe Pastor Lawrence, you could just be over here and come, come to maybe my right, your left. If you prayed that prayer, if you want prayer for children, come over to this side and we'll pray for you. God bless you. Been wonderful to be with you this morning. Worship team is going to just lead us in a song, and uh, I'll hand back to you. Thank you. Bless you guys.